Over the last day, there has been a very interesting conversation going on on Twitter provoked by this tweet by Nigel Warburton, Philosophy Bites. If you can't say it clearly, quit philosophy. That's quite an imperative there. And it stems from, I think if you look at his account, several other things that he's been saying over time. And Nigel Warburton is, is somebody who has an academic background, but then went off on his own and is, you know, quite successful as a podcaster, a writer, you know, doing, doing public philosophy. So it's, you know, it's not just some person getting on there and spouting something forth. Presumably these are some well-considered thoughts and he, he probably didn't just shoot from the hip as you would say, but deliberately posted this. And there were a lot of responses. As you can see, one of the great measures is quote tweets. Those are people who are uh, retweeting it, but they're also saying something above it. And we're going to look at some of those. There were also many response tweets as well. And there's a number of likes. And I think you could tell there's a lot of people who didn't like that sentiment. So I thought it would be quite interesting to aggregate some of them. I'm not trying to be totally representative or say that I'm, you know, being systematic or comprehensive, but the ones that I thought were particularly interesting and on point and to talk about those a little bit because this issue of clarity or clearly, it's not quite so straightforward as many people would like to make it out to be. So let's jump right in. Here is a whole set of most, yeah, these are all quoted uh, tweets, right? And they, they express something that we can put our finger on. So the first one says, yeah, screw learning, I guess. And this is really about how we do, in fact, learn. What is philosophy like? Should it just be the product that we put out there or should it be a process? So another response, oh no, my first attempt at explaining something wasn't perfect. Instead of having people tell me where I'm being unclear and improving my own ability to say something clearly, I'm just going to quit. That's a, a valid response, right? Better than the just screw learning, I think. But the screw learning has something to it. Another one, if you can't say it clearly, keep doing philosophy with the aim of increasing clarity. Again, you start to see this common theme, right? Maybe doing philosophy, putting stuff out there, part of the natural process is we go from the less clear to the more clear. Here's another one. It's easier to be clear about questions or topics where others have already done the work to make it easy to say things clearly. Let's not discourage work where it's needed most. And that's quite true. If you're doing listicles and, you know, the sort of thing that's, that sometimes passes for public philosophy, it's very easy just to aggregate what other people have said very clearly already, which was a lot of work on their part to, to get that material to that point, and then to put it out there. Now, here's a, a nice thing from... Hegel, right? Hegel on saying it clearly. And we'll just look at the things that, that are underlined here. We learn by experience that we meant something other than we me meant to mean, and the correction of our meaning compels our knowing to go back to the proposition and understand it in some other way. You might say, well, that's unclear. Actually, it's not. I mean, that's, that's how, in fact, we often do learn. Anybody who's ever graded papers and given commentary or feedback on them and said, well, you know, this, this part needs to be rethought, and, you know, maybe you need to place it in this context, knows what we're talking about here. Hegel, by the way, is often criticized as one of the writers who's the least clear, right? Here's another one. I think philosophy works best when there's a healthy exchange of people putting wild, jumbled ideas into the world and other people refining, clarifying, and synthesizing those ideas, suggesting that there's something like a division of labor or functions and that these are complementary and we don't need to give sweeping assertions about, you know, if you can't do this, then just quit. Let's move on to the next interesting set. So here's another uh, angle we can take on it. 
here's, here's one. I think my biggest disagreement with this is the assumption that clarity is a property of writing rather than a property of the relation between the writing and the reader. Yes, clarity is not something that is merely a quality of one's prose or of the writer him or herself, right? And sometimes there's, there's other factors at play. This next tweet uh, shows that. Two quitters. Obscurity is inexcusable on two grounds. It may be deliberately adopted. Uh, is, sorry, obscurity is excusable on two grounds. It may be deliberately adopted as in Heraclitus, or the obscurity may be due to the abstruseness of the subject and not of the style. An instance of this is Plato's Timaeus. This is Cicero talking in uh, On the Ends, book two, where he is, you know, acting as the critic. And, you know, that's, that's a, a good thing to keep in mind. This is a, a point that gets made over and over again throughout the history of philosophy. There are some things that are, by their very nature, going to be obscure and require us to really work and work and work to get them clear. Here's another one. Rather nasty attitude for lots of reasons, but most basically, clarity of thought, speech writing is both a skill and accomplishment, not some innate essence. If you can't say it clearly now, keep working on it. And then uh, here's one, there's an exchange that goes on. Um, Massimo says that uh, same mistake as Feynman, as the, who a lot of people are big fans of and, and you know post his stuff all the time, some things cannot be said clearly because understanding them requires a significant amount of background knowledge. So clear is relative to the audience. It's interesting here. We're seeing that, you know, classical rhetoric and then whatever we carry forward from that is by its very nature attuned to the audience, not just the subject matter, not just the speaker. Right. So this is an important set of points. And then here's a, a final one in this. It's all very well to talk of clarity, but when it becomes an obsession, it's liable to nip living thought in the bud. Friedrich Weissman, how I see philosophy. So let's look at the next set. Uh, these are talking about something that we've already touched upon, but now we're getting a little bit deeper into this. Many rightly criticizing this tweet, but there is one criticism I have not yet heard. One can neither say nor think what is not, so it's not even possible to not say it clearly. Right? So we're, when we get into murky things like negation or the not or, or nothingness or things like that, there's going to be some obscurity involved in those, and it's going to take us a lot of work to get at, at them. And those are legitimate uh, areas and domains of philosophy. Here's another one. This is an extremely bad take. Strive for clarity, sure, but the deepest waters are murky. Just try not to drown, friends. I, I think there's a, a great truth to that. We can, as philosophers, try to make those deeper waters less murky, but they're, they're usually going to be involving some unclarity even when we get to the very bottom of them. Another one, hot take, basic ob observation about information. Some things are more inherently complex and more incom incompressible into simple language than other things are. Read with care, use your brain, and you won't find yourself complaining bitterly about pre presentation. And now that's true. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't a lot of people writing, speaking, doing things unclearly out there. But there are complex topics, and there's a mistake in trying to make things more simple, more clear than they really ought to be. Finally, this is right, but not for the reasons they think it is. Clarity opens up disparate connections. It has nothing to do with being easily readable. Sorry that philosophy is difficult sometimes, bro. I, you know, I, I, this is one I have to think more about. Um, yeah, I, I do like the idea that clarity, when it's being done well, opens up additional connections. It shouldn't be like things are clear because I've said the last word. Now everyone sit down and shut up. You know, it's. It, but there is a, a you know a real talent to making things easily readable. I don't think that easily readable necessarily means oversimplified or um, leaving things out or, you know, not using terminology that people use. Let's talk about this next one. So a lot of really good reminders here. 
Uh, don't quit. Philosophy has diverse traditions and styles. Clarity is often important, but be mindful that the insistence on being clear without qualification can sometimes reflect a reluctance to be receptive to work that doesn't align with the norms of one's own tradition. And then here's another great reminder along these lines. Clarity looks very different from the perspectives of various traditions and how clear you are can also just straightforwardly be a matter of how familiar your audience is with those traditions. Clarity is not a neutral thing, nor can it be attained outside of a specific context. So, you know, for example, if you're working within the history of philosophy and you, you know, spend a lot of time, a great example in, in my own case, with the Stoics, when you talk about things like the indifference, right, that's a technical term and, and it has a certain meaning and it requires some unpacking and there's ways of going at doing philosophy that to some people might seem very obscure, very, uh, you know, confused, but, but can be clear in that context. And we can, expi we can expand this much more widely, you know, if you're reading uh, the Confucian Analects or the, or the Mensis, right? Uh, and you say, oh, this is a totally unclear. I can't figure out what the argument is. Well, maybe you need to spend more time with that and look at it from within that, that uh, framework. Here's some more stuff about this, uh, specifically focusing on analytic philosophy. It's, spe it's special to hear this repeated over and over again by folks whose ordinary language analytic ph philosophical project is best represented by Wittgenstein's aphorisms. Do what you say and quit this claim itself if is not clear if you stay in philosophy after repeating it, right? And then just going to say some analytic philosophers have a weird understanding of what clarity is. Don't throw at me what about it continentals in the comments. Couldn't care less about them either. But that's the story for another tweet. And I think that's quite right. There is a fetishization of clarity, which, you know, like all uh, sort of faith commitments, typically involves not looking too carefully and closely at what's actually meant by the liturgical language. Uh, and I think that there is something to that. That said, the continental philosophy does contain a lot of deliberately obscure stuff, which when you untangle it doesn't, doesn't end up meaning anything, but that's not to say all continental is like that. But here's a great example of turning this on its head by referring to a specific philosophical tradition. Clear and distinct perceptions, or GTFO. Now, who's that referring to? The entire Cartesian tradition, where it's not about language and expressing yourself clearly that way. It's about clarity in your mind, defined in terms of having clear and distinct conceptions or perceptions. And, you know, when you read Descartes, um, there's, there's some work that's required because it's not always totally clear. Let's move on to uh, another set of responses. Now, here we get turning it back on itself, this demand. You know, if you can't say it clearly, quit philosophy. And so people say, this is a remarkably unclear and speculative statement, funnily enough. And, and that's true, because what's it? What's clearly, you know? Um, another one, the meaning of this statement is, of course, not entirely clear. And then, for example, now we get down to a little bit more granular areas. If starting a statement with if, then follow the if clause with a then clause to establish a relationship between the two clauses. As a further example, always clearly establish an antecedent prior to using a pronoun. So, you know, like with a lot of really lapidary statements of philosophy, if you turn this on itself, it fails by its own criteria. Um, then they turn this on to Nigel Warburton himself. If you can't state your recommendations for would-be philosophers without assuming that what's clear to you is clear to others, then quit making such recommendations. So there's the quitting there. And then this tweet lacks clarity. I guess he should quit philosophy. So, you know, there's this is kind of an interesting way of turning things on its head. And, and actually, Nigel uh, Warburton responded to one of these um, in, in a way that that's quite revealing, I would say. So the, here's the, the quote tweet. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what you're saying. Any chance you could clarify? And then he says, obscurantis nine danka, you know, meaning uh, no thanks. I'm, I'm not going to engage with you, although I will engage with you enough to say this thing right here. So when given the opportunity to clarify what he means, I suppose, by it or clarifying or quitting or philosophy, uh, he, he just, you know, 
gave this response instead. Here's another one, uh, also uh, you know bringing up some perhaps inconsistency. This is the guy that literally used oratio recta and oratio obliqua in a tweet defending himself on accusations of transphobia. So you know I. I I'm a little reluctant to say, oh, if you're not totally consistent, then, you know, you have to be quiet and get out of here because that seems rather unfair to me. But, you know, the, is, is our practice completely consistent when it comes to this sort of demand for clarity? I don't know. Here's another set of important reminders. Um, Tell that to Plato, Aristotle, Hegel, Heidegger, Kant, all the other Germans, Machiavelli, Montesquieu, Locke, Cicero, Xenophon. Um, okay, that, that's an important group, and we could expand it much more widely. There's Every one of these has some parts that are not immediately intuitively evident in their writings. Um, they're maybe not as unclear as some people make them out to be, but, uh, you know, it's... Um, you know, they do require work. And here's another great example that, that Nigel Warburton responded to. Clarity is a philosophical virtue, but any necessary condition that would exclude Zhuangzi, Lao Tzu, Nargajuna, Dogen, Heraclitus, Aristotle, Spinoza, Leibniz, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche, and Wittgenstein from the practice is clearly an unreasonable one. And Nigel's response, which is a good response, I think, it's probably too late for any of these to quit. So he's, he's indexing his thing to us in the present. Uh, here's another great one. So if I need to read a supplemental text or introduction to get a clear understanding of what a philosopher is saying, they should have quit. All right. OK, got it. Um, another one, this kind of conflation of the love of wisdom with the love of logic is like an, uh, the astronomer who thinks math makes the sun rise. That's a, a pretty good analogy, I would say there. And then finally, some of my favorite philosophers are luminously clear, others much less so. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Meaning, you know, why do we need to insist on clarity for every single philosopher in every single case? Here's another set of very important concerns that we've mentioned a little bit earlier, but now are brought to the fore in the, these two tweets. Does anyone have a useful working definition of what clarity in philosophy is? Why should clarity, whatever that is, trump other philosophical virtues? Why believe from the outset that philosophical truths can be expressed clearly? Don't want to dunk, just genuine questions. And then finally, I get that this is maybe tongue-in-cheek, but I think more practitioners need to look at the ideology of clarity here. Who is defining what clarity is? What does it look like? What does it involve? Why is it necessary? And who is holding that position? These are some very, very important questions. I don't think they have to be roadblocks where we say, oh, well, clarity, until we can answer these questions, throw it out the window. It doesn't matter at all. But we shouldn't you know, take clarity or clearness or whatever we're going to use as synonyms for this as being itself inherently clear. If we do, we're probably screwing things up in some ways. We, we really need to think through at least, at least through a couple steps, these questions, you know, what is clarity? Um, why should it be made so important compared to other philosophical virtues. There are, there are other things that matter in philosophy. Who gets to decide what counts as clarity? Are there some philosophical truths that might not be able to be expressed clearly? You know, these are really serious questions that we need to explore rather than just assume answered. There's a few uh, tweets where um, we've got Nigel responding to them. And I think the response is, we don't have to make too much of these, but they're, they're interesting. So one person says, faux intellectual, anti-intellectualism is alive and well, I see. And then he responds, I've never claimed to be an intellectual, I'm a writer. I think that's kind of disingenuous because, you know, obviously a writer is part of the intelligentsia and he's writing about philosophy itself. So, so I mean, it's, it's a good sort of off the cuff response. I don't think it, it uh, answers it. Is this really, though, faux intellectual, anti-intellectualism? I think that's probably uh, going too far in the accusations. This next one, bad air, bad air. Now, obviously, if you know your literature, that is a reference to Nietzsche's genealogy of morals and the discussion about how values, false values are created and resentment. So I think what he's doing is he's, he's claiming that this is an example of 
resentment or the you know slave morality or something like that. And then Nigel responds by saying, air or hair? Do I have, you know, bad air here or bad hair? Uh, again, really a, a non-response, but, you know, an example of wit. Um, now, this one's a bit more interesting. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Being used as a response to Nigel Warburton telling people they should quit doing philosophy. And, you know, Nigel's response here is actually... A pretty good one. That tweet undermines itself, right? Because maybe this dictum, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I, I should have, you know, had this response when I was a kid. That's self-defeating, right? Because it's not really nice to tell people that they can only talk about nice things. Or uh, maybe it is niceness in a, you know, meta nice level. I don't know. But that's something definitely worth worth thinking about. Um and then finally, here's here's another one. If it can't be because if it can't be put as a bullet point on a PowerPoint slide, it's not a true point. And then Nigel says, interestingly enough, no, because life is short. Now, when I read that, I was like, OK, I often say life is short, but I don't use that as a reason to um, demand that everybody be totally clear all the time. I do use it sometimes to say, hey, what are, what are you getting at? You know, you've got a limited sliver of my time. What are you actually trying to say in conversations? Um, but they don't have to be necessarily bullet pointed. It seems like he's kind of endorsing this. If you can't say it, you know, very briefly, because he had another tweet where he said something like that. If you can't sum up your philosophy and, you know, basically an elevator pitch, it's not very good at all. Um I think that there's a lot of cases where I would be like, life is short, so I need to spend the time to figure out what the hell Nietzsche is actually saying here or Hegel's saying here. I mean, think about the half hour Hegel videos that I make, right? I, I've got maybe another, if I'm really, really, really lucky, 30 years or 40 years left of life, and this is what I spend my time on, right? So I don't know. This life is short response I think that can go a lot of different ways. So you can say there's an ambiguity there as, as well. Now, here's the last two. And I think these are, in some respect, the best responses altogether. So the first one, the speaker is speaking. Can you hear the sound? The listener is listening as he hits the ground. The medium or the message, but there's no one around. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe the stars of Warburton were waiting for me. <laughs> So reference to a song, I think, if I remember right, and that's kind of clever. But this one is the absolute best. My prose is so clear, people see right through it. Now, there's some intentional ambiguity there. On a literal level, you know, obviously, if your prose was so clear that people can see right through it, there would be no prose because they'd be seeing the blank page or the blank website or whatever it happens to be, right? They can't see the things that stand out. But, you know, if we think about what it means to be so clear, you know, as, as meeting some ideal that people see right through it, it could be that people see exactly what my motives are, people see through it in the sense of they're like, well, this is bullshit and I can see that it's bullshit. You know, when we talk about people seeing through somebody else's statements, that's usually what we mean. And so this is a, this is a really clever one. It's saying, I'm going to say that I meet your ideal so well that people can see that what I'm doing is no good. And so that, that I think that's a very clever uh, response, the most clever response out of all of them that I've, I've seen. So there's clearly a lot to think about. People are going to say, well, you know, hey, what's your position on this clearness thing? I think I've given you a few hints about that, but I, I have a lot more to, to, to think about this myself, to mull over, to reflect. This is not something that is by itself totally clear to me. And I think that, you know, we, we do have the whatever you want to call it, the freedom, the leisure, the luxury, the right to not have to take a stand on this immediately and to think it through a bit. So that's about as much as I am willing to contribute on this, this matter. Hopefully you've enjoyed reading through these. You might go to the original tweet, which I'll put a link to in the uh, video description. And if you have takes on, on this position, Go ahead and leave them in the comments. 
and uh, yeah, we'll we'll just go from there. I'm sure that in the days ahead, this is this is a, a tweet that is not going to go away, and there'll probably be a lot of other re interesting responses to it as well.